Um, sorry. I'm trying to see. I've been having glasses, it's glasses issues for months now. <laughs> so good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Diana Ayala, Chair of the Committee on Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. I'd like to thank my colleague, Council Member Margaret Chen, Chair of the Committee on Aging, for co-chairing this hearing with me today. Today, we are here to learn more about the home health care workers in New York City and the services they provide, such as personal assistance and health care supports to older adults, persons with disabilities living at home, and in community-based settings. We know that the home, home health care workforce is primarily comprised of women and people of color and has doubled in size over the last 10 years. The greater demand for home care services, driven in part by an aging population, has and will continue to create significant shortages of skilled nursing home skilled home health care workers. And we know this field experiences a high rate of turnover and often struggles to find and retain qualified workers. In fact, some researchers have estimated that there will be a national shortage of 151,000 home care workers by 2030 and 355,000 workers by 2040. Because we know the need for this impo these important services will continue to grow, today we hope to understand how to better support our home care uh, aids and ensure the needs of those individuals who depend upon their critically important services will also continue to be met. It is our hope that we can provide and strengthen the necessary supports to help our home health aides and citizens they serve. I want to thank the administration and the advocates here today, and I, want, I look forward to hearing more about all of the work that they're doing and the role that the City Council can play in supporting their efforts. I also want to thank committee staff, Council Sarah List, Policy Analyst Chrissy Dwyer, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt, and my Legislative Director Bianca Almedina for making this hearing possible. Thank you. Well, Chair uh, Chen will now give her remarks. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you for joining us today for our oversight hearing joined with the Committee on Mental Health, Disability and Addiction on Home Health Aid Services. I, went to, I want to thank Chair Ayala for co-chairing this hearing today. Study shows that programs that support aging in place produce a host of benefits for older adults, including improving their health outcomes increasing their financial savings, and helping decrease the advancement of memory loss as they age at home. New York State provides home care programs which are designed to help eligible older adults and individuals with disability remain safely at home. These long-term care options include Medicaid, funded home care and personal care services, consumer-directed personal assistance programs, managed long term care programs, assisted living programs, care at home programs, and long-term home health aid care programs. In the city, the Department for the Aging, or DIFTA, works with case management agency to offer in-home care services to older adults. These services include an evaluation of benefits, home deliver meals, personal care, housekeeping, advisement on long-term care challenges, DIFTA's friendly visiting programs, and referrals to resources. According to the 2018 Mayor's Management Report, DIFTA provided over 1.1 million hours of home care services and nearly 544,000 hours of case management service in fiscal year 2017. This, despite these figures, Hundreds of city seniors are on wait lists for case management services. Further, there's little public information available about both HRA and DIFTA's home care service programs. This is very concerning, considering the rapid growth of our city's older adult population and the increasing demand for home care services. As reported in a 2018 New York City consumer a fair report, analysts predict by 2040, New York City will be home to 1.4 million seniors, with 70% of them needing long-term care during some point of their lives. Today's hearing will provide an opportunity for the committee to better understand the landscape of home care programs 
in New York City through the testimony of the administration providers and advocates. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in organizing this hearing. Uh, our counsel, Nusa Chadari, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, and finance analyst, Daniel Koop, and finance unit head, Sohini Dohini Supora, and i also like to thank my legislative uh, and deputy chief of staff, Marian Guerra. Uh, i also like to introduce uh, the council member on the aging committee, uh, council member Valong and council member Drum. Thank you. And I'd like to recognize council member Samuels and Holden from the uh, health, uh, mental health committee. Thank you. Um, our general counsel is gonna administer the uh, affirmation now. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. I do. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairpersons Chin and Ayala, and members of the Committees on Aging and Mental Health, Disabilities, and Addiction. I am Alan Hom, Deputy Assistant Commissioner for the Bureau of Long-Term Care at the New York City Department for the Aging. I am joined this morning by my colleague Annette Holm, Chief Special Services Officer of the New York City, uh, New York City Human Resources Administration. On behalf of Acting Commissioner Karen Resnick, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss DIFTA's work in home care. DIFTA's overarching mission, as you know, is to work to eliminate ageism and ensure the dignity and quality of life of New York City's diverse older adults through service, advocacy, and education. We accomplish this by partnering with hundreds of community-based organizations to provide services through senior centers, naturally occurring retirement communities, case management, and home care agencies, home deliver meal programs, mental health and friendly visiting programs across the five boroughs. Additionally, DIFTA directly operates our Caregiver Resource Center, Senior Employment Services Unit, Elderly Crime Victims Resource Center, Foster Grandparent Program, Volunteer Resource Center, and a whole host of other supportive services ultimately designed to keep New York City age-friendly and to help seniors age in place. The expanded in-home services for the elderly program, or ICEP, through which DIFTA's home care program is funded, was established by New York State, Chapter 894 of the Laws of 1986. The overall goal of this program is to improve access to and the availability of appropriate and cost-effective non-medical in-home support services for older adults who are not eligible for services through Medicaid. As a state-funded endeavor, DIFTA's contracted home care programs are required to abide by a comprehensive set of standards prescribed by the New York State Office for the Aging, NYSOFA, including oversight of client eligibility, cost sharing, training requirements, and other operational mandates. DIFTA has a program monitoring role to ensure our home care agencies are in compliance with these standards. This includes a yearly assessment of each agency by DIFTA program officers. Through DIFTA's contracted home care agencies, older New Yorkers are provided services that support their functioning in their homes, their daily living, and ultimately their ability to age in place. Individuals must first contact our case management agencies prior to accessing important DIFTA in-home services such as home delivery meals and home care. In FY18, more than 33,000 older New Yorkers received case management, an increase of 3% compared to the previous year. That same year, a total of 3,600 unduplicated clients received home care services. A typical DIFTA home care client may be someone who needs support with laundry, light housekeeping, preparing meals, grocery shopping, and or someone who needs personal care assistance, such as assistance with bathing, grooming, and dressing. In addition to our 21 case management agencies across the city, DIFTA contracts with four, case ma uh, four home care agencies to directly provide home care services. These agencies include Personal Touch, personal touch Home Care of New York, Inc., 
contracted to support Brooklyn and the Bronx. The New York Foundation for Senior Citizens contracted to serve Manhattan. People Care Inc. in Queens and Richmond Home Needs Incorporated of Staten Island. As required by ISEP, each contracted home care agency must be licensed as a licensed home care services agency, otherwise known as LICSA, by the New York State Department of Health to assure care is provided within health and safety standards established by Article 36 of the Public Health Law. The core functions of LICSAs are to identify the client's needs and capabilities through a comprehensive in-home assessment, to develop a comprehensive care plan in collaboration with clients and caregivers and prescribe appropriate interventions, to reconcile the care plan with the CMA assessment, particularly if the, ident if the identified needs and the service hours differ, to implement the care plan itself, and to ensure that the performance of the home care worker is meeting expectations. Consistent with NYSOFA regulations, individuals authorized for DIFTA-funded home care must meet specific eligibility requirements. In order to be eligible for home care, a senior must be 60 years of age or older, have functional limitations as shown by the need for the assistance of another person with at least one activity of daily living, such as bathing, personal hygiene, dressing, eating, toileting, mobility, and transferring, or two instrumental activities of daily living, otherwise known as IADLs, such as housework cleaning, shopping, laundry, use of transportation, preparing and cooking meals, telephone use, and self-administering medications. Have unmet needs for assistance with ADLs and or IADLs, be able to live safely in the home if support is provided and to self-direct care, and be ineligible for housekeeping, a home attendant, or home health aid services under any other government program, including Medicaid or Medicare. Additionally, clients are required to share the cost of services based on income. Determined by a NYSOFA imposed formula, clients will either be required to pay a sliding scale fee or asked to make a voluntary contribution. The sliding scale rate ranges from $1 to $25 for each hour of service. Clients who elect not to provide any financial information will be required to pay the highest cost share amount. Failure to pay the agreed upon cost share may result in termination of service. Eligible clients will be authorized a specified number of weekly hours of home care. Clients may periodically be authorized additional hours or days of service for special circumstances. A client in need of an escort to a doctor's office, for example, may qualify for additional hours of service. DIFTA funded home care is generally available Monday through Friday and up to eight hours per week for housekeeping chore services and 20 hours per week for homemaker personal care services. Night or overnight services are not available through DIFTA's home care program. Finally, all of DIFTA's home care providers work to match the most appropriate worker to clients. The New York State Department of Health also dictates the provision of timely, reliable, and consistent service and a backup system which provides replacement or substitute workers to at-risk clients whose current workers are unable to provide care. In addition to client eligibility, the state also dictates the standards by which the home care workforce is hired and trained. LICSAs are required to adequately and appropriately screen their workforce, including home care workers and supervisors, prior to employment. Each LICSA must have a demonstrable and systematic process for screening all applicants for such competencies and qualities as ability to read and write, ability to record messages and keep simple records in the language of the client, ability to communicate with clients, their families, and other caregivers, and the ability to understand and carry out instructions. Applicants must also have a positive attitude towards older people with physical and or mental impairments and undergo a criminal history check. As prescribed by the State Department of Health, Home care workers must also meet required training requirements upon hire. 
proof of successful completion of trainings must be provided prior to the time of employment or within three months of being hired. This includes the New York State Department of Health approved 40 hour basic training program, which covers such fundamental topics as working with the elderly, body mechanics, personal care skills, safety and accident prevention, and food and nutrition preparation. Home care workers must also complete an elder abuse training. Ongoing education and training are also mandated by the New York State Department of Health in order to maintain and improve staff competence. Compliance includes the development of an in-service training plan to help workers develop techniques and skills not covered in basic training. In addition to abiding by these licensing, hiring, and training requirements, our home care agencies must comply with a variety of operational mandates. Lixus, for example, must have a written client complaints procedure that includes timeframes for responding, investigating, and resolving client complaints. If the home care clients are encouraged to report complaints to their home care agency, case management agency, or to DIFTA directly. DIFTA also conducts an annual client satisfaction survey of a random sample of approximately 45 clients per home care agency. In an effort to improve overall quality of care, these results become part of the agency's annual program evaluation. As we look to the future, when older New Yorkers are projected to reach 1.86 million by 2040, our commitment to the older adult population, including those who are homebound, remains steadfast. Although our home care program is small, relative to the much broader Medicaid home care landscape, continuing to fund high quality home care remains among DIFTA's top priorities. Maintaining a positive working relationship with various state partners and oversight agencies allows us to accomplish this important endeavor. Thank you for this opportunity to offer testimony on DIFTA's behalf, and I am pleased to answer any questions you may have. Good morning. Thank you, Chairperson Ayala, Chairperson Chin, and members of the City Council's Committees on Aging and Mental Health, Disabilities and Addiction for inviting us to testify and respond to questions today. I would also like to thank my colleague, Alan Hom from the New York Department for the Aging for his partnership and for his testimony today. My name is Annette Holm, and I am the Chief Special Services Officer of the New York City Human Resources Administration. The New York City Human Resources Administration Department of Social Service is the nation's largest social services agency, assisting more than 3 million New Yorkers annually through the administration of 12 public assistance programs. Every day in all five boroughs, HRA provides essential programs and support to low-income New Yorkers. We work to ensure that our services and benefits provide low-income New Yorkers the assistance they need through a wide range of supports, including cash assistance and employment services, the Supplemental Nutri Nutrition Assistance Program, eviction prevention, rental assistance, and Medicaid. As part of our array of social services, HRA administers Medicaid-funded fee-for-service long-term care services through our Home Care Services Program. I would like to take a moment to contextualize the current state of home care services program by briefly outlining the state takeover of Medicaid in the state of New York and how it has directly affected the home care service program. Prior to the implementation of, the, of New York State Medicaid redesign, HRA Home Care was the local entity responsible for the determination of Medicaid and personal care service eligibility for all New York City residents seeking personal care assistance. The implementation of the New York State Medicaid redesign, otherwise known as MRT-90, required the mandatory transition and enrollment of certain community-based long-term care services recipients into managed long-term care. This state project, which was initiated in 2012 with approval from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, was designated to integrate services and improve health outcomes 
for individuals in need of community-based long-term services and support. Within two years of MRT-90, the overwhelming majority of HCSP home care cases were transitioned to managed long-term care plans. Medicaid-eligible clients in receipt of Medicare and whose home care needs exceed eight hours per week were required to seek home care services from New York State contracted managed care and managed long-term care plans. However, clients under the New York State Nursing Home Transition and Diversion Waiver or Traumatic Brain Injury Waiver or in active receipt of hospice services are exempt from managed care and can receive HRA home care services. Currently, the home care services program determines Medicaid eligibility for all applicants seeking long-term care who are in receipt of Medicare, age 65 or over, disabled and or blind, including those enrolling in the MLTC plans. Citywide, a total of 192,740 New Yorkers are in receipt of personal care services. Of these cases, Home Care Service Program is responsible for the direct administration of only 5,050 fee-for-service cases. This is as of February 2019. This subset is 2.62% of all state personal care cases in New York City. These cases are exempt from mandatory managed long-term care enrollment in New York City. For this population, HRA assesses home care eligibility and develops a care plan to meet the specific needs of each person. HCSP contracts with 28 licensed home care providers to administer the services. The providers with whom we contract are licensed by the state. The long-term care state regulations dictate the protocol for training and qualifications of personal care aides in New York State. HRA home care services permit clients to remain at home in the community with assistance and possibly avoid nursing home placement. These services provide assistance with activities of daily living, which includes bathing, grooming and dressing, ambulation, taking of medications, laundry, grocery shopping, house cleaning, and escorting to medical appointments. Through our five community alternative systems agencies, otherwise known as CASA offices, HRA provides case management for clients receiving fee-for-service Medicaid home care services. The case managers assist clients with Medicaid renewal applications, home care service renewals, applications for SNAP benefits and rental assistance, and makes referrals for additional services provided by Adult Protective Services, HIV and AIDS services, and partner city agencies such as DIFTA as needed. For the approximately 5,000 cases that HRA administers, the Home Care Contracts Division within HCSP conducts fiscal and programmatic monitoring of the 28 contracted New York state licensed home care service providers. To ensure program integrity, we conduct annually three programmatic monitoring visits of each home care contra contractor, during which we, ex we assess compliance with contractual service requirements and New York state home care regulations. For example, we check to make sure the home care providers, nurses, are visiting clients at least every 90 days to assess the home care worker's performance and semi-annually to assess each client's care plan to ensure it meets the needs of each individual. In cases where any deficiency is found, we require providers to develop corrective action plans and conduct follow-up visits to ensure the issue has been properly addressed. Other examples of performance indicators are fingerprinting and criminal background checks of home care workers, annual home care worker evaluations, and medical examinations with drug testing, client contacts, and client satisfaction surveys. In terms of fiscal compliance, 
HRA staff conducts fiscal monitoring visits to evaluate the adequacy of contract internal controls, deter fraud, and assess contractor compliance with laws, state regulations, and HRA requirements. And similar to our programmatic compliance monitoring, we also monitor corrective action plans and conduct follow-up visits to ensure that any issues have been addressed. Any suspicion of Medicaid fraud is reported to the HRA Chief Program Accountability Officer and the New York City Department of Investigation. I would like to reiterate that HRA only contracts with and oversees vendors that provide home care services in the category of Medicaid funded fee for service, which represents approximately 2.62% of New York City's home care caseload. The overwhelming majority of home care cases in New York City are provided through managed care organizations, which are contracted with State Department of Health and with whom HRA has no contractual or oversight relationship. In order to give clients the opportunity to voice any concerns about their HRA contracted home care services, HRA also administers a complaint hotline. HCSP's Complaint Tracking Unit investigates all complaints to determine if the individual is on HRA's caseload and to assess what, if any, actions can be taken to assist the client and remedy the situation. Where appropriate, vendors are required to file a corrective action plan to ensure they have policies and procedures in place to prevent the same issue from happening again. Vendors are monitored and given annual performance scores based on the number of complaints and resolution of complaints, which encourages adherence to programmatic guidelines. In the event a client calls HCSP for a complaint related to managed long-term care, the caller is provided with the number to the state managed long-term care hotline, which is 1-866-712-7192. HRA is committed to helping all individuals in need access high quality services, services for which they are eligible. Even though HRA administers a very small portion of the home care universe in New York City, we take pride in the work we do to link vulnerable New Yorkers to services which can be provided in the home and help them to remain in the community. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I also want to recognize Councilmember Cabrera and Councilmember Heimdeutsch. Um, thank you for your testimony here today. This, I've actually been waiting for this hearing for a really long time. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a hearing that's really you know, important to me um, for several personal reasons, but most specifically I'll share a story of an incident that occurred uh, in November that really reinforced my interest in learning more about this process and how it affects countless of New Yorkers that are completely dependent on care. Um, I have a constituent who suffers from, she has mus muscular dystrophy and she's 100% dependent on care. Um, she cannot bathe, she cannot walk, she's, uh, she cannot even feed herself. She needs someone to cut up her food and, and feed it to her. She was uh, raised by her parents who are deceased. She's now middle-aged, living alone, um, very little family, and again, completely dependent on a home care worker to come in and provide her all of, you know, meet all of these needs for her. Um, Thanksgiving, I called, I was making rounds and calling people, and I called her, it was maybe 1.30, almost 2 o'clock in the afternoon, to wish her a happy Thanksgiving, and, um, you know, she mentions to me that she was home alone because her home care attendant did not show up that morning. Now, she, she has a split shift, and I know that this is kind of falls into the managed care, but I wanted to kind of, I, I really need to share her story because I think it's a story of countless New Yorkers. And so her home care worker who was supposed to be there at 7 a.m. is not there. She's a diabetic, so the, the nurse uh, from the visiting nurse program came in that morning and gave her her insulin and left. 
And so now it's almost two o'clock in the afternoon and she hasn't eaten, she hasn't had anything to drink, nothing. So I happened to live a few blocks from her home and I asked her if she wanted something and I picked her up something to eat. And when I spent a couple of hours with her, um, feeding her because she doesn't have anyone, you know, she can't, she can't, she has very limited mobility in her arms, so she's barely able to maybe answer her phone. Um, and I was shocked, you know, at the fact when I walked in first, the first observation was that her door was open. And the reason that her door is open is because she can't get up to physically open and close it. So she has to leave the door open 24 hours a day so that the home care worker can let themselves in and out. Um, because the home care worker is not a consistent person, is they, they rotate people, um, then she can't even give a person a key to come in because that may not be the person that's showing up tomorrow, right? Or that's coming in later on in the afternoon. Um, so we, you know, I listened to her story. I was really just, you know, heartbroken that the system has failed her in the way that it has, but I was at least comforted by the fact that her home care worker at seven would be there um, and someone would be, would be with her till the, uh, the next morning. The next day I called her and she informs me that the seven o'clock p.m. home care worker didn't show up either. Had I not called her that afternoon, she wouldn't have had anything to eat the entire day. And this is not uncommon for her. It's also not uncommon for her to spend countless days in bed because she can't get up and she has no one to pick her up and put her in her chair. But it's also a common you know, thing, theme for her to sleep in her wheelchair because she's been out and about, because she's actually very active in the community. And when she gets home, she has no one to put her in bed, so now she has to spend the night in her chair. And that, to me, is inexcusable. That is somebody's child, that is somebody's friend, that is somebody's aunt. And the fact that she is completely dependent on care and that no one is picking up on the fact that this is a significant failure in the system to me is very impactful. And so I, the, I was hoping that this hearing would shed a light on, on this and better guide the discussion moving forward in terms of you know, where our advocacy needs to be channeled, be it at HRA, at DIFTA, at the state, but that no one is really addressing this or speaking about it as publicly as maybe we should be is a problem. And so I wonder, in, in, in cases like the one that I just uh, explained, who is she expected to contact? Is this, is, this a, is this client expected to then pick up the phone and call a 1-800 number and file a complaint? For HRA, we value those that we provide service to. And um, hearing your story is quite difficult, and I'm sorry that this happened to this individual. If she would have contacted HRA, we would have helped her to contact the state. For example, in a case like this, where someone should have 24-hour split shift service, in our program, one home attendant does not leave until another home attendant is in place. So she should not have been left alone. Um, we do have a system in place where if a home attendant is not, has not clocked in by within an hour of reporting time, we log it because we have electronic verification of attendance and we would know that that home attendant did not show up and the vendor has three hours which they have to send a backup home attendant. But in this particular case that you described to us, the home attendant that was there should not have left her alone until another home attendant was there. It's considered abandonment of a client. So we would contact the state on behalf of her if she called us, and we would let the state know, and the state would contact the managed long-term care and the provider and address that situation. We have had similar cases like this, that they contact us and we would intervene. We do provide the 1-800 number for those who want to advocate for themselves, but if they are unable to, we will assist. Is there a special priority given to clients who are immobile, who are completely dependent? So if they receive 24-hour care, just like you said, split shift, 
our process is that 1A does not leave until the replacement is there. But had there been cases where that has happened? Not for HRA, I cannot speak. Never in the history of HRA has a client been left alone because a replacement was not available? I cannot say that never in the history, but I am saying that in the process that we have now with verification of attendance, we will know if that aid did not report to work, and we will ensure that a replacement is there. Now, when a replacement is, is called in, because it's, and again, I will focus primarily on the disabilities component of this, and I will allow Margaret um, to really hammer in at questions uh, regarding uh, the older adult population, but um, when an individual, um, and, and this is a, another real life story, uh, this actually is uh, my nephew, has cerebral palsy, he's 19, he's completely bedbound, nonverbal, uh, completely dependent on care. If his mother, who is his primary care worker who has to work, um, has a home care worker, oftentimes the home care worker who she loves is not, she's had case, she's had workers that have come in that are like nine months pregnant that cannot lift him, right? Great workers, you know, great people dedicated to what they do, but not necessarily able to deal with people with disabilities. And, and she has been told that the home care workers don't necessarily know what type of situation they're walking into until so the moment that they walk in because of, I guess, fear that they will discriminate and decline cases based on the, the, the individual client's needs. Um, and she understands that, but however, feels that after the home care worker is in the home, now there are certain tasks that need to be performed because it's the, 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 the client is not able-bodied and nonverbal, so cannot communicate and um, give directive. Um, so there's a, there's a, she says there's a lack of, of communication from the agency to the workers and even from the worker, from the agencies to the caregivers who oftentimes are not told within enough time that a replacement is coming in. And so there have been incidences where she has had to like personally uh, either not show up to work that day to stay and care for her son or scramble at the last minute to try to find somebody else that can. So I think that's kind of two questions and, and, and one is how prepared are the workers before they come into a home of a person with a, dis a severe disability to um, adequately treat them because <clears throat> assuming that the pool of workers work with a variety of clients that are able-bodied clients, clients that need more, more help, um, before they come into a specific household, however, are they instructed on the level of care of that particular client? It is for our contractual responsibilities at HRA that aides are informed of the needs of the client before they are assigned to a case. So if, if a person is, is told, how, how would it ever happen that a person that is maybe nine months pregnant or whatever, pregnant enough that they cannot or should not be lifting a client that needs to be you know, moved, how does that happen then? I cannot answer for this specific case, but I can but it, tell it, you. That's not a, it, it's, I'm saying, I'm using that as, a, as, a, as an example, but I've heard that, that same scenario where is either you know a person who has a back injury and cannot move a client is too elderly to move you know or, or, or you know physically uh, move a person from the bed to the chair or from the chair to the bathtub um, an individual who just physically can't perform those tasks but are consistently being sent to care for those clients so we work with our providers to ensure our contracted vendors to ensure that they provide the best quality of and level of service that they can. We require that they speak and consult with the client or with whoever is representing the client that when we are sending aids out, the aids that are sent out are there to meet the needs of that individual client and any replacements that are sent out should be held to that same standard as well. Do you see a lot of turnover? I could say with you know the home the home care world, the landscape, 
there is turnover. Um, I wouldn't say there's a great deal of turnover, but there is turnover. But there's a great need for additional workers. There's always need for workers in this field. As the population ages, there is need for additional workers in this field. And how is HRA prepared to recruit new workers? So the vendors are the ones who actually rec um, recruit workers. They are the ones who train the workers. It is the feel of um, the providers, be they child providers, or if they're home attendant providers, personal care providers, that they reach out to um, the community at large and obtain workers. Now I know that the focus is really on the home care, but I wonder if a child is disabled and is able to go to school um, and receives a lot of those services during the day uh, at, an, uh, at, at another setting. Once that child gets a certain age and no longer qualifies for those services, it's kind of like a, a gap in services. Is the home care field um, prepared to deal with kind of filling in those, those gaps or is it just focused on the home care needs? Like is there ever a conversation? Is there a like a discharge plan? This you know, child is no longer you know, getting uh, physical therapy at the school so that that service, is, is, that, is that a coordination that happens at the home care level? So we do assess our cases on an annual basis. If it's a split shift case, we assess every six months and we review the needs of all of our clients. If at any time that their situation changes, they can let us know, submit um, current doctor's orders, and we will review the case and assess the case and reassess them for the level of care that they need. Now, how many cases does HRA oversee now? 5,050. 5,050. Okay, and what is the total budget? 32 million. Can you explain what the training process is for your aides? Personal care aides are trained by the home care providers. They are required as a new home attendant to receive 60 hours of training, and subsequent to that, they get trained every six hours every year for renewal training. Okay, all right. I'm going to uh, allow uh, Council Member Chen to ask some questions. Thank you. Um, we were also joined by Council Member Eugene earlier. Uh, the Youth uh, Committee is having a hearing at the same time. <laughs> so that's why you see Council Member uh, running back and forth. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, I wanted to ask a question. In your testimony, HRA, uh, that you testify that you have, you contract with 28 agencies? That is correct. Licensed home care providers? That is correct. And DIFTA, who has more client, and you only contract with four agencies in the five borough? Um, we have four agencies over, uh, providing services in five areas, uh, five boroughs. Um, but I believe HRA has more clients. It's, it, did I hear correctly? Well, HRA is that they only have like 5,000 clients. Correct. And DIFTA, through the ISA program, you serve more than that? We serve, uh, we currently serve about uh, 2,900 clients, but last year we served 3,600 unduplicated clients. Okay, so a little bit less than HRA, but they have 28 agents, 28 providers? In, in our last RFP, we had, um, uh, we had only inquired for five contracts, one for each of the boroughs. Um, and based at that time, um, we, we contracted it based on the amount of clients that you know, we uh, were currently serving and intended to serve. You know, based, based again on, uh, on the population data that, uh, that we had at that time. So in, uh, HR, um, in the HRA testimony, you said that citywide, there's a total of 192,740 New Yorkers that are re in receipt of personal care services. That is correct. So out of that population, HRA only take care of about 5,000, and then DIFTA, about 3,000? 
around that, yes. So then the rest is taken care of by state oversight? That is correct. That is wow. correct. <laughs> okay. I think that's why there are a lot of views going on. Um, that is something that uh, that's before the Medicaid redesign, was that population uh, served under HRA? Before Medicaid redesign, the population that HRA actually directly provided services to was 45,000 um, individuals. With the implementation of Medicaid redesign, our caseload shrunk to 5,000, approximately 5,000. Okay. And did that affect DIFTA at all with the Medicaid redesign? Um, so. No, because uh, through our state funding source, ICEP, uh, we were always only able to serve um, non-Medicaid-eligible uh, seniors. But with the, okay, but with the, uh, the ICEP program, there's always a waiting list because there's a waiting list for case management. Because right now, uh, the data that we've gotten from providers is about 1,000 seniors uh, on waiting lists for case management. And there's about like, about 100 that's waiting for home care. There, yes, there's, there's currently a waiting list. Um, for anyone who is on the, the, uh, the waiting list for case management, um, all the clients are eligible for, uh, for a home deliver meals. Um, anyone who is on the wait list for case management, um, it basically uh, means that they've at least had the in, uh, an interview over the telephone. The case management agency has at least an understanding of you know, uh, what their needs are over the phone, and if they need a meal, that's going to be given to them directly. Um, for the home care um, uh, wait list, um, those clients have at least been seen by their case manager. An in-home assessment has been done, and it was determined that um, they needed um, you know, some sort of home care. Um, our agencies have been able to do um, uh, quite a bit, and we're proud to say you know, with, with what they have at the moment. Um, but even while the client is waiting for home care, our case managers, um, funded through the case management agencies, um, will, con will look to see what other resources in the community are available um, through benefits, entitlements, other resources, so that the clients can still at least um, get some services while they wait for home care. So who does that? So you're talking about the, the case management agency help do that assessment? Correct. So if someone, if a senior calls and said, I don't qualify for Medicaid, mm -hmm. but I need some home care yes. service. Yes. But they don't, they don't get assessed right away. Mm -hmm. well, what because there's a waiting list. <laughs> what will happen is that um, the case management agency will still um, uh, speak with the client over the telephone um, to get as much information as they can and still try to find um, and try to link them up uh, uh, with appropriate resources and referrals um, while they're waiting for an in-home assessment by the case management agency. But if, if the senior needs home care, mm -hmm. I'm basing on constituent that we've been working with, right? The reason that they contact um, the the case management agencies, because we refer them, because um, we know about the ISA program, mm -hmm. but a lot of people don't even know about the program, but need the help. Mm -hmm. But by the time they call, they really need the help. Like one of the senior fell, and his wife cannot manage. Mm -hmm. So the only resource they have is either families or friends, or they have to pay someone that might not be trained, mm -hmm. uh, or might be very expensive, because now they have to wait, right? right? right. So. That's why you know we really want to get rid of the waiting list because senior usually by the time they call they need the help then. Yeah, right? absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we we and and our case management agency partners we we certainly value everybody who contacts them, um, and we uh, we really do our best to make sure that our case management agencies are involved. Um, case management agencies also work with let's say. In, in the case of a caregiver, 
Um, they also work with um, the caregiver resource centers. Uh, there are DIFTA contracted caregiver programs that they can also link up with. So um, you're right, there, we, we, in the system. Um, my, my thing is that they shouldn't be on waiting lists. And every year there's a waiting list. So we're trying, you know, with the city budget, try to figure out, and I think we're asking DIFTA, OMB, and working with the provider, figure out how to eliminate that wait list. Because the senior, especially the seniors who don't qualify for Medicaid, right? Mm -hmm. And they, a lot of times they think that they can't get home care service. And when they find out about the ISA program, they were very surprised. And when they get the service, they're very happy. Because in your testimony, it's great because DIFTA do provide oversight and really work with this agency, they are much better uh, than what the private sector is offering. I think with the Medicare, the Medicaid redesign, there's a lot of abuse going on. Mm. And I don't know if HRA, are you, are you or DIFTA tracking all the new home care agency that's popping up that are together with the, my big issue, the social adult daycare, that's popping up all over the city, and there are more of them than senior center. There are over 300 social adult daycare, and we only have about 249 senior center. So is anyone, is HRA monitoring all these new home care agency that's opening up? I know we passed a law to, for DIPTA to have the social adult daycare uh, to register, so at least we know uh, how many they are, and we're doing you know, more to provide some oversight because they're, they're supposed to be under the state jurisdiction. So now we got uh, the health department to go out and now inspecting you know, every social adult daycare program. But now we also have these new home care agency that's popping up. So is HRA doing anything? Because the, the client, they get the Medicaid they have to go through HRA to apply for Medicaid, right? Yes, so anyone that is receiving Medicaid funded personal care, we, will, we are responsible for the processing of their Medicaid. However, we are only, we contract with the 28 providers that provide services to the, fi the approximately 5,000 clients we provide services to. However, any new provider that's coming on Alixa, a licensed home care services agency, must be licensed with the state. So the state has oversight of any licensed provider that's coming on board. But you, but HRA don't have that information. No, we do not, we do not keep track of that because we do not provide licensure of these providers, but we do keep track of the 28 that we contract with. Okay, I think we would have we would have to do something, uh, maybe through legislation, like what we did for the social adult daycare. Does the state keep track? Mm -hmm. Because, uh, yeah, the state keep track, but whether they would share the information, and maybe HRA can ask the state. Well, the state uh, um, has it on their website. So on their website, any licensed home care providers that are out there in the state, it is listed on their website. But I think that, I mean, one of the, the issues that came up in preparing for this hearing was also trying to get more understanding about the training process because what we have heard complain about, um, right now the latest thing is uh, family care, right? Family member uh, who could apply to be a home care tenant to take care of their elderly parents. And we've heard that they're abused where they actually were not doing their job. Uh, they're not providing the care. Uh, but they, you know, they clock in, they clock out, and they go and do something else. So the senior is not getting the services uh, they're supposed to be getting. And because it's a family member, they can't complain. So there are abuse going on, and we want to make sure that there are oversight because there are a lot of new home care agency that are popping up uh, together with social adult daycare because the senior that go to the social adult daycare the complaint that we have also heard, that they have to sign up for home care service, even though they might not need it. Because they shouldn't be going there in the first place. They should be going to our regular senior center. 
So there are, you know, these abuse going on, and the complaint that we file, that we get people to file through DIFTA, DIFTA sends it off to OMEG, and we get a report back every year. Uh, so with HRA, do you get any kind of reporting back from complaint that you refer up to the state? So any complaints that we directly refer to the state, yes, they will report back to us to let us know the outcome of that report. Can you share those information with us? Or do you have others? I will have to get back to you on that because generally, quite honestly, it is a case-by-case -case basis. So we get a call from someone and we report the case to the hotline and we will contact our colleagues in the state and then they will get back to us as to how that case was resolved. Yeah, I think it would be good to, we can, you know, get some information uh, so that public know that when they do file a complaint that there are investigation and they can get some result. It's not like people say, well, what can I do? I, nothing's gonna happen. Uh, so that's why I think it's important that we were able to get data about the social adult daycare. At least people know that when they file a complaint that is being investigated. Do we have, uh, okay, someone? Oh, okay. Okay, I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Councilmember Holden. All right, thank I'll you, come Chair Chen. Um, I have some questions on um, while, while campaigning in 2017, I came across so many individuals, um, um, shut ins, who obviously needed help, but nobody was providing them any help whatsoever. And I could see that by just the way their homes looked, the way they're uh, even walking up the uh, steps of a, like a stoop, it, it would almost collapse on you. So th there are so many seniors out there, and it shouldn't be a waiting list, by the way, but so many seniors out there that need help that we don't know about. What's, what's HRA doing in outreach? Uh, are they doing a mailing to uh, seniors? Um, because I don't, I don't remember getting one. I'm a senior myself, <laughs> but I don't remember getting anything in the mail um, and my mom is 95 and I'm, I provide for her. She's, she's got um, dementia. She never gets anything in the mail. Um, so could you tell us what, how, what outreach you're doing? So in terms of HRA, generally what we do is our community alternative systems agencies, so if we call CASA offices, they go out into the community and they conduct presentations in regards to the services that we provide. Again, I just would like to reiterate that our services that we provide are quite limited. We provide basically housekeeping services and we provide services to anyone who is otherwise exempt from managed long-term care. But for the services that we do provide, we do go out um, to senior centers, we go out to senior citizen buildings, to community presentations. We just try to get the word out that this service is available. And by doing that, we have received some referrals based on those um, presentations that we present to the community at large. But there's no mailing. Why, why, don't, why doesn't the city do a mailing to seniors saying, here's what's available for you. If you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't get around, you can't walk, you, or, you, or you can't cook. The, the, nothing like that is being done in the city of New York? Currently, no, but it's something we could discuss with the council. I mean, it's something that we would definitely consider. We would love to get the information out there to let people know that this service is available. All right. Now, this 90-day this um, survey that you do with, the, with your clients, um, is that um, with a nurse, right? That's with a nurse? Every 90 days, uh, your testimony? Yes. Uh, is we there a physical? It's not a survey. It's a nurse that goes out into the home. So it's not just like somebody calling on the phone. We actually yeah. have a nurse that goes into the home that assesses the case to ensure that the service provision is of the quality that they are contracted to provide. Yeah, I, I've seen that. I've, I've been with the nurse um, in some, with some constituents um, when they visited. But did, did they do a physical? Is there any... Um, like, uh, are they taking blood pressure or are they, are they doing a physical? Well, this is not a certified home health aid service. This is personal care. So the only time that they would look, at, they would look at something, like if somebody has a wound, they would look to see what the wound looks like, but they're not providing any hands-on care. If they determine that someone is at risk at that moment, they will contact 911 or contact the pro pro medical provider if needed. Okay. Um, uh, on the... Uh, 
on the in-home services um, that uh, these not-for-profits are providing. Do, when, when an attendant can't, attend, can't um, go to the home, or for whatever reason, is there a backup uh, person provided um, at all? That, that's, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Um, the home care agency is required to offer a backup, yes. To offer a backup or to just automatically send a backup? They contact the clients to see, you know, what happened, um, and they will ask the client, you know, uh, we can get someone for you today. Um, if you're okay uh, today, we can, you know, send someone uh, another day. But they must uh, offer a backup. And, and how often is there a survey uh, like HRA does? Uh, is it every 90 days or is it w once a year? Um, well, the, the survey, meaning, you know, we contact the clients and, and, and ask, are you happy with, this, you know, are you happy with the, the, the aids? That's done about once a year. However, um, the, uh, the home care agencies that we contract with um, they are required to have a nurse or supervisor visit the client um, every six months uh, to make sure that the aide, you know, uh, that the aide is doing what uh, he or she is supposed to do, that the client is satisfied uh, with the service. In addition, um, because the client also has a DIPTA funded case management agency, um, the case manager the case management agency will also contact the clients every two months to determine how satisfied they are with their service, whether it's uh, home deliver meals or home care. So the clients are checked up uh, pretty regularly, I have to say, and the case managers really do a good job. And they have a great communication uh, with the home care agency um, because they, they've been partnering with them for so long that, um, that many of the case managers in the home care agency they know the clients. They they know what their um, uh, what their needs are, what the clients' um, personalities are. So um, they make a great team. So your office provides just once a year oversight uh, on on an individual case. So they'll send somebody over to the residents. Um, our uh, DIFTA does not actually provide the direct service. We contract with the with the home care agencies uh, to provide that direct service. Uh, but we have a, a program monitoring um, uh, uh, responsibility. So let, let's say you don't contract with the visiting nurse service, let's say, to go and check once a year? Oh, uh, no, no, sir. We, we don't have a contract with visiting nurse service. Only with the, um, the four um, home care agencies um, uh, that provide the the ISIP funded home care age, uh, services. So this is the home care, uh, home care services provided through, through the state office for the aging funding. Okay, is there a physical checkup once a year with the client? Um, By our, whatever agency? Oh, um, our, our home care agency, the nurses, they don't do a physical um, because again, that's, it, it, it's not that level of right. air. Mm -hmm. um, but our case managers and the, the supervisors, the aides who, who serve the clients, um, they do observe the clients, they do observe um, you know, how strong they look. Um, they typically know what, uh, if you excuse me for saying like what the baseline of the client is and if the client looks more you know, tired or, or, or just not herself or himself, um, the case management agencies um, would contact perhaps the client's, you know, daughter or son. Um, they may reach out to the doctor and say, hey, you know, something's going on with the client. You know, let's, let's try to figure out, you know, what she needs. Right. So, so, so let's say they don't do a blood test. No blood is taken. Oh, no. Nothing like that. No. Do you see that? That might be a problem because if the person's not going to the doctors, if they're homebound, and if they're not getting out enough, maybe they're not, you know, they're missing something here. So I, I think we might look into, I mean, might possibly be something we have to, as a council, look at is actually giving them, giving them a physical, actually looking at individual cases and, and doing a simple blood test. Our, our home care agencies do a, a magnificent job as far as providing um, the, um, the personal care. Um, 
taking bloods, that's more of a medical model, and our, our funding, ISIP, was never, was never meant for that you know, type of medical care. Right. Okay, thank you. I have a follow-up question, because so, I'm really concerned about this whole correlation between the state and the city, and of the 40,000 plus, because there were 45,000 individuals that were receiving home care services prior to the Medicaid redesign, right? So of the 40,000 plus cases that were transferred over to the state, uh, since HRA uh, stated, uh, based on your testimony today, you do provide some level of uh, interference. So if a, if a client is not satisfied or is having uh, issues with their services, HRA can and has, in fact, uh, then contacted the state on behalf of that client? Absolutely. So if a managed long-term care client calls us and we look into the case and we determine it's a managed long-term care case and we would provide them with a the number as I stated in testimony but if the client is in imminent risk we will contact the state on their behalf. How, how would the client know to contact HRA? Well sometimes clients get the you know they see the complaint hotline tracking number and they may just say I have home care and as you stated, they may not know that it's a managed long-term care. All they may know is that I'm receiving a home care from a provider. So somebody may give them this number and they call us. But if by chance the call gets it directed to us, we will ensure that it gets to the right entity. Do you know how many of those calls have been made from HRA to the state on behalf of clients? We don't track those numbers. You don't track them? No. Do you track the number of, com the, the types of complaints that you're receiving so that there's better coordination between the city and the state in terms of the level of services that are being provided to clients? So again, I guess I have to just go back to the fact that when they call us, if it's a case that is for HRA, that case is tracked. If it is a case that we have to eventually shift to the state, we do not track that I case. understand that. I think that my concern is that because you, you're not tracking it and no one else is tracking it, that there's a, there's a, there's a fine line, right? And there's a, a, a gap, again, in services and an opportunity for clients to kind of fall into some sort of donor hole where no one is really assessing how appropriate or not a service is. Um, and so I'm, if HRA, if the city is not tracking that, then who is? Well, the state will track it. So if, they, if a person calls us and we funnel them to the state, the state will track those calls because they track all of the calls that come in related to managed long-term care providers. All right. All right, Martha, do you have any other questions? Um, so for DIFTA, um, the ISA program, what is the total budget now? And you guys, I think we got some good news from the state that we got a little bit more money? Um, well, our, our budget uh, is about uh, $30 million. And uh, we do expect to receive a portion of the $15 million um, increase uh, for ISEP, um that we will use towards our wait list. Do you know how much? Uh, we don't know yet, uh, but we are um, waiting. Um, we are in talks with the state, I believe, and uh, but we don't know yet. Bottom no. line is uh, we don't know uh, what the number is from the state yet. Uh, there, wasn't there like a projection about three point something million, three point five, or? Yes, um, I, I think it's projected to be about that amount. Is that enough to eliminate the wait list? Or well, how much does uh, DIFTA, does DIFTA sort of like estimate getting rid of the wait list, how much money do we need to put in? You know, we, our, our case management agencies, our home care agencies, we're proud of what they're able to do with the current budget. Um, and we are talking with OMB um, to figure out, you know, uh, how much uh, would be needed for the wait list. 
because we gotta have a, a solution. We can't have a wait list every year. And then I know that uh, the administration did put in money um, in the past, you know, whether it's $2 million, $1 million, but we gotta figure out so that we can supplement and make sure that seniors who call for the service, that they don't have to wait, right? Because it already takes some time to do the assessment, the home visit, but waiting for that, I mean, that is really unacceptable. Yeah. So we really have to really work on, because it's a wonderful program, because there are many seniors, and the senior population is growing, and there are many seniors who work all their life and made the contribution, pay their taxes, and they don't qualify for Medicaid. So, and they thought that, oh, I, and I can't afford to pay somebody personally. And also, you know, the person might not be trained. So this program offer quality services uh, at a cost that they could afford or no cost, uh, which is great. And the seniors that we were able to help they really rave about the program. I mean, they love the home care attendant because the agency do send people who could speak the language and really were trained. And they're not, you know, they're not like a lot of hours, you know. Sometimes these seniors only need, you know, 10 hours a week. Um, but that 10 hours that they get, it's life saving for them, right? So we got to make sure that program like this get the support it need and also the publicity to let more people know, more seniors know that this is available to them and more caregiver and family members that they know that, wow, I can call and get this help, you know, for my elderly parent or relatives. So we got to work on eliminate a wait list and then work on expanding the program. I want to do thank you. Um, Councilperson Chin, because it, it's wonderful to hear that your constituents like this service. You know, the, the department acknowledges that you also love this service and, and everyone in the council loves this service. Um, and as seniors get older, um, we'll definitely see, you know, more and more need um, to serve our seniors. You're, you're absolutely, um, you know, I think we agree on that. Yeah, so we gotta really work together you know, with the state, but also to figure out, you know, the investment from the city, you know, from the administration um, that, look, senior population is growing. They're part of our future. And we, we want them uh, to be able to continue to stay, you know, age at home, stay in the community that they help to build. And in the long run, they're saving the government a lot more money when they're not in nursing home, when they're healthier. So it's a good investment to start making now. Um, and I'm glad the state, you know, put in more money, but 15 million is just a little bit, right? Uh, so we need to continue to advocate from the state level, but the city administration, the city also have to make that investment. Yes, Maybe sir. the city should match it <laughs> so that we can eliminate, you know, the wait list this year and it, years to come, you know? Um, well, we still have other questions, but we'll send it over um, to the agencies. But I really think that the population um, that qualify for Medicaid is really alarming that it's such a huge population and HRA is only taking care of such a small number. And meanwhile, there is not enough oversight uh, that really help the seniors who are on Medicaid. Uh, I know it's the state, but a lot of times the state oversight is not enough. So we have to figure out a way, how do we work with the state to make sure these home care agencies are providing, you know, the training and doing what they're supposed to do. It's the same thing with the social adult daycare, because some of them are not doing what they're supposed to do. And nobody is, you know, overseeing that. And we really have to fix that. Um, so I don't know if uh, Chair Yellow, you have any other question? Oh, we've been joined by Council Member Traeger. Do you have any question? Okay, why don't you go ahead? Thank you to, to the chairs for holding this very important and timely hearing, welcome. I'm just, and forgive me if this was uh, covered earlier, but I'm just curious to hear about um, 
any type of data or information you have with regards to uh, those seniors or people who, with disabilities who, need, who require home care longer than eight or 10 hours, people that need folks with them 24 hours all throughout the week. Uh, these are some of the cases that we hear are very complex and very difficult at times for folks to navigate the process to secure that, that, that type of assistance. There was a case I was working on recently where uh, we're speaking with someone from the state on providing care for a young adult who needed assistance basically 24-7, but we seem to hear that the person who was supposed to live with, with the, uh, you know, the young adult cannot be a recipient of any type of housing subsidy um, in order for them to live uh, and provide care. And the last time I checked, many of these home care uh, workers, they're not receiving a sub major substantial salary. Some of them require the assistance of a housing subsidy to afford to live in New York City. Have you heard of cases such as this? Um, and any type of information or data you can provide in terms of why is it difficult to secure assistance 24 hours a day, seven days a week? In New York City, HRA, when we assess cases, we assess cases based on need. Right. So d based on whatever your medical need, as long as you're Medicaid eligible and you are medically eligible and we determine you have a need for any level of service, be it from eight hours a week of housekeeping to split shift, which is 24 hours around the clock to AIDS, we will provide that service. I cannot speak for the state. Um, I could just tell you what we do in HRA. And in terms of the housing subsidy, I don't fully understand that question. Um, mm. That's a little bit confusing. Neither do I. Oh, okay. <laughs> because so we're both on the same page. I ask because if, if, if you know of anything about this, because we were shocked to learn that uh, the home care uh, providers, apparently, if they are recipients of, of a housing subsidy, then the state is giving them a difficult time providing um, substantial care to folks who need it, need it at home. And that was kind of news to us. Maybe I'll follow up with your office after this yeah, hearing. Yeah, maybe we could connect afterwards and we could discuss it because I'm right. a little bit confused as to. As, as was my office. <laughs> okay. So right. I, I, I appreciate that. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks. You're welcome. I just have a question around mental health. Are the, are the, is the training that is provided to the home care workers, does it in, in any way, shape, uh, involve some sort of mental health training, identifying you know, uh, early signs of dementia, uh, depression? Yes, it does. It does? Okay, that's good to hear. And then I also wanted to hear a little bit about this because this is a complaint that I get from my seniors. I thought Margaret would probably bring it up. But I get a lot of complaints of seniors that have bed bugs that are unable, so, you know, it, it, bed bugs are a problem in and of itself, but when you, when a person who is a little bit more frail and unable to do the necessary uh, home ha housekeeping that is required to remediate the conditions of the landlord will come, they'll exterminate, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the home in order to truly uh, remediate the bed bug condition. And oftentimes these older adults are unable to perform those tasks on their own. The home care workers uh, oftentimes, in my district I hear this a lot, uh, are refusing to come back to the home until the bed bug uh, epidemic or issue is remediated. And so we have clients that are le being left without services for an uncertain uh, you know, number of, of days or weeks um, because the client is unable to really truly address this. So I wonder, I know it's, it's a very specific kind of of a problem, but I'm sure that, you know, considering the number of people who have had uh, an issue with bed bugs in the last, you know, uh, 10 years, it, I'm sure that you've come across cases like this, and I wonder what is the, uh, the, the, the alternative, is, is either agency uh, advocating with maybe a community-based group to help bring in those services if the home care worker is unable or unwilling to assist in that way? Um. For DIFTA-funded clients, um, if that has happened, um, they work very closely with the case management agency to find, as, as you were saying, resources in the community 
um, that would be able to, um, you know, help the senior remediate the uh, the bed bug issue. Um, I mean, frankly, bed bugs are are is a chronic problem in some areas of the neighborhood, and home and, and the um, the personal care workers and the home care agencies obviously are are, are afraid, are are concerned. Um, you know, passing along bed bugs to another senior or, or to another um, uh, client. Uh, but for DIFTA funded clients, um, our case management agencies, because they work with the home care agencies, um, because they share those clients, um, one of their main tasks then would be, well, how do we, how do we help the senior? How do we figure out, um, you know, how to pay for the, for the remediation? Is it up to the landlord? Um, advocacy may be needed with the landlord. Um, they may need to find a company and maybe even try to find some way to help pay for that service. Um, that, and I, I think that's kind of where the issue lies is that, you know, most of my seniors are living on, you know, under $9,000 a, a year in income. <clears throat> and so it becomes, you know, difficult, nearly impossible for them to pay for that, that level of service. But because, again, you know, if you're receiving home care, that means that you have a specific, you know, unmet need. Um, and the, the home care worker, the person that's tasked with helping you with those needs is unable or unwilling to deal with, you know, whatever remediation work is, is happening in the house because for whatever restrictions they have in terms of the, the duties that they're assigned to do, um, is APS being called in to come in and say, hey, you know, this client needs somebody to help them wash all of, you know, their clothes, pack things up. I can't do that. It's not part of my job description, but somebody needs to do it. I'm not hearing that at all. And I have had clients that have been without services for over a month because they cannot and that, that doesn't change from day to day. If you can't do it today, you're not gonna be able to do it tomorrow. And the job of the providers is to really, not only to recognize that, but to then make the necessary arrangements to have somebody that can fulfill that come in. And so I would love, for, if, you know, and probably this is one of the follow-up, if you would uh, share with us some of the ways in which, you know, the agencies are doing that because there's no reason why any older adult or anyone who is, you know, really uh, dependent on care should be without uh, services because they have an issue that could easily be remediated by bringing in another organization or agency. So on behalf of HRA, when we have a client that requires personal care services and they are at risk without those services, and it's a situation of bed bugs, we have often relied on respite care to try to get them short-term care respite while we address the bed bug situation so that they are not in the home at risk without personal care. Um, we have done that in the past. We can get back to you. We have also reached out to eight community agencies to see if they could assist us with clients who, after they get the bed bug situation eradicated, there are still other things that need to be done, but we can definitely get back to you with that information. I, I would appreciate it, because okay. it seems tedious, but it's a really big deal in my community. I mean, I've had seniors that, you know, have been banned from their local senior centers because they have bed bugs and now the home care worker who's not providing the service at home went and told the senior center that the senior has bed bugs and now the senior center doesn't want them at the senior center, so now they're completely without services. And so, uh, you know, we, we, we hope and we assume that the people that are tasked with caring for these vulnerable populations are doing it in a very holistic, you know, manner. And so I thank you for your testimony today. I don't know if uh, Council Member Chen has any other questions, but I am done with questions for today. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for your testimony. And if there's any other questions, we will forward it to you. And uh, I hope that HRA and DIFTA, you know, really uh, work together um, on this collaboration in terms of uh, home care services and really try to figure out a way to work with the state. Uh, so that's more oversight uh, to really protect our seniors and, and the vulnerable population. But thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We're going to call the public. Okay. Uh, Tara Klein from uh, United Neighborhood Houses and Tara Cortez from the Harvard, in Harvard Institute of Geriatric Nursing at NYU.
Hi. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Chair Chin, Chair Ayala, and the uh, committee members for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Tara Klein. I'm a policy analyst at United Neighborhood Houses, which is a policy and social change organization representing 42 neighborhood settlement houses in New York. Um, three of our members uh, provide nonprofit home care services to their communities as state licensed home care services agencies in the city, and that's Chinese American Planning Council, St. Nick's Alliance, and Sunnyside Community Service Services. Together every year, these settlement houses provide services to over 4,500 individuals with nearly 7,500 workers throughout New York. Uh, today, I'd like to provide an update on the legal challenges surrounding New York State regulations on home care employee pay structures, specifically on the 13-hour pay rule, and argue that this is the time to put pressure on the state to make policy changes that will support low-income home care workers while simultaneously supporting the financial sustainability of nonprofit home care providers. Um, and there are more details in my testimony. I'm going to skip through some of it. Um, so under long-standing New York State Department of Labor regulations, a residential home care employee who works for 24 hours uh, must only be paid for 13 of those hours, with the remaining hours exempt uh, and reserved for sleep and meal time. Um, there are some exceptions to this, um, but in practice what happens is that most employees who are working for 24-hour shifts are uh, working far more than 13 hours and only being paid for 13 hours of work. Um, in some cases, employers will take a loss because they're not reimbursed by their plans for additional hours, but they want to pay the workers. But really, this is all because state regulations set those rules and those are reflected in insurance reimbursement rates. And so, in 2017, a series of state court decisions brought by workers invalidated the DOL's 13-hour rule finding that employees must be paid at least the minimum wage for all 24 hours of a 24-hour shift, regardless of sleep or meal time. Uh, these cases were appealed, uh, and this led to a long period of, of uncertainty for the home care industry. Providers feared that if the courts ruled in favor of the plaintiffs and the 13-hour rule was abolished, they would be responsible for approximately $1 billion per year industry-wide in new payroll costs. Uh, these cases were not expected to compel insurance plans or the state to cover these costs, leading, leaving those costs on the provider. For nonprofit providers that rely on Medicaid reimbursement rates, this was a devastating prospect with many fearing bankruptcy. Even further, the lawsuits were expected to include a retroactive back pay component for the last six years, adding another $6 billion to that tab. Uh, on March 26th, about two weeks ago, the State Court of Appeals ruled on these cases to overturn the decision of the lower, co lower courts, effectively preserving the status quo of the 13-hour rule. While the legal door is not completely closed, providers are breathing a small sigh of relief. However, especially for nonprofit providers who serve vulnerable community members and seek to promote social justice, a decision that perpetuates near poverty wages is not one to celebrate. And so, uh, UNH has developed a series of policy recommendations uh, to New York State that we believe the state should consider to help stabilize the home care workforce. These solutions all require some financial investment. However, the sector's employees are currently forced to accept dire wages in large part of, because of those state regulations. And so therefore, it should be the state's responsibility to cover these costs and rectify a system it has neglected for decades to the detriment of workers. We hope the City Council will act as a partner in advocating to the state legislature this year to advance some of these policy ideas. And again, more details are in the testimony, but briefly, first, it's very simple. We think the state should consider funding full 24-hour pay through Medicaid reimbursement rates. Uh, next, the state should explore expanding the use of multiple split shifts for 12 hours or maybe eight hours for certain cases. As we've heard today, this is already used for many patients. But expanding this model would improve working conditions by making sure that employees are paid for all the hours that they work, um, effectively making that 13-hour rule irrelevant. And this would also reduce overtime pay costs for providers. 
Um, however, split shifts aren't appropriate for all clients, um, especially those with complex care regimes who prefer consistent aid. So this cannot be the only solution. Uh, next, the state could explore using variable on-call pay rates for sleep and meal times. So for example, certain nurses are paid at three-fourths of their rate for their on-call hours. Um, this could also work as sort of a per diem system, um, which would provide relief to workers while also minim minimizing additional overtime expenses to providers. Um, and finally, given the unique challenges facing the home care workforce, including this 13-hour pay structure, workforce conditions, and the pending workforce shortage that we've heard a little bit about today, the state should consider uh, coordinating oversight of the industry and developing best practices moving forward. We think that this should start with a short-term task force of relevant stakeholders to create a comprehensive reform plan to stabilize the industry and support the workforce. Uh, and that uh, task force could also advise on the need for a permanent public home care advocates office to act as a central liaison and resource hub for employers, employees, and home care recipients. Um, so we'd love to be a partner with the council on this. We'd love your support in advocating to the state on uh, this very important topic. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like to also ask Wayne Ho from the Chinese American Planning Council to join the panel. Thank you. You may begin, Tara. Two Taras here. <laughs> I can get that wrong, Tara. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you turned me on. Good morning, Chairperson Ayala and Chairperson Chin and all council members present. My name is Dr. Tara Cortez. I'm the Executive Director of the Hartford Institute for Geriatric Nursing, the, it, which is the geriatric arm of New York University Rory Myers College of Nursing. And I thank you for the opportunity to testify today and share my expertise in the topic of nursing health aid, health aid services. As we've heard today, the number of older people in New York City is growing rapidly. 10,000 people across America turn 65 every day, and this number is reflected in New York City. Our present direct care workforce cannot possibly meet the needs of our frail and vulnerable aging population and the gap between the need and demand will only grow over the next two decades. Unless we begin to address the workforce now, the gap will grow to crisis proportion. To address the gap, we believe there are, we must address two issues, and one is recruitment and one is retention, to ensure we have an adequate and well-prepared workforce. First, we must support policies which expand visas to include all members of the healthcare team and specifically direct care healthcare workers. One of four direct care workers today in New York City is an immigrant. This approach increases not only the number of potential direct care givers we have, but also increases the cultural diversity of the workforce to meet the cultural diversity of our aging population. Also to increase uh, recruitment, we should start working with high school students. We need to do more in terms of our students coming out of high schools to make jobs in healthcare sector a reality for them. And certainly many of our nurses, our registered nurses today, as well as physicians, started as direct care givers. Home health aides is a very common place for healthcare workers to begin, and certainly this is a wonderful opportunity for our high school graduates. So I do, we do believe that this is another target area for us to increase recruitment. Second, we must rethink the education of direct caregivers. Their work requires much more than just the skills of mechanics, nutrition, cooking, and feeding. There's a large turnover in direct caregivers in all the environments of long-term care. With the increased complexity of aging, the increased complexity of caring for adults living at home, it, it is essential that home health aides be trained, and I'll say educated, not trained, to understand the unique needs of older adults. For example, we did talk today about depression and dementia and, and, and care of patients with dementia. 
We at the Hartford Institute, through a grant, trained 1,200 home health aides in one LICSA in New York City. When we, before we started, we asked them their confidence level in caring for people with dementia, and the response rate was 30% of them felt slightly comfortable or not at all comfortable. We, we provided them with a course designed evidence-based care of people with dementia, and at the end of it, 30 days later, we asked them what their comfort level was of caring for people with dementia, and it increased to 80% of them felt very comfortable or comfortable. So I think there is a need for a distinct type of education, which is more than just skills, but to understand that when somebody kicks you, when someone hits you, when somebody curses you, it's not because they don't like you, but it's because of the disease. And I think this is something that needs to be even year after year instilled in our direct care workforce. It is a major reason for turnover in the long-term uh, long care workforce. Uh, there are other areas of education. We talk about the age-friendly health, age health system, which includes the four Ms, and that's what matters to the patient. Are we teaching home health aides to address what matters? And if it matters to them to get up at 9 o'clock instead of 7 o'clock, it's what matters to the patient. Are we addressing medications, that different medications the patients are on might cause certain behaviors? How is the pharmacist working with the direct caregiver to provide packets that the caregiver could actually administer themselves? How are we dealing with mobility? We can teach them that, you know, how to walk a patient, but what is the importance of mobility in a patient? If we let someone sit for, in their chair for, for 16 of the 24 hours or be in bed, uh, for, for 20 of those 24 hours, they're going to lose mobility and they will be bed bound. How do we avoid that? They need to understand the hows and the whys of all of that. There is a, there is a division, I think, between what they, what, the, what they know and what they need to know, and I think this needs to be a policy that their educational needs are addressing these kinds of issues. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'd like to thank the chairs of this joint committee hearing as well as city council members uh, for holding this hearing on home care. My name is Wayne Ho. I'm the president and CEO of the Chinese American Planning Council. We are the nation's largest Asian American social services nonprofit, and we have a wholly owned subsidiary known as the Chinese American Planning Council Home Attendant Program, CPC HAP, uh, which is a licensed not-for-profit home care agency based here in New York City. Every year, or actually every day, we serve 3,000 consumers through our home care, and we employ over 4,500 home care workers. Um, these workers span a range of uh, ethnicities and languages, reflecting our belief in cultural competence in this area, ranging from Chinese to Spanish, English, Russian, Korean, and other languages throughout the five boroughs of New York City. Um, as a licensed home care agency that's a nonprofit, oftentimes we feel that we are caught between state regulations, city regulations, uh, legal and court issues, as well as contractual obligations. We have contracts with uh, the Human Resources Administration of New York City. We also have contracts with 26 managed care organizations or managed long-term care organizations. But the key of where the funding comes from each of these contracts is its state Medicaid dollars. So I'm here today to ask that, uh, that we partner with the city council to make sure that we have a solution on how we can address retroactive issues in the home care sector, which infects not just, affects not just the home health aides, but also the consumers. But also we have a forward-looking solution to figure out how we can work together to stabilize the sector, stabilize the not-for-profit licensed home care agencies that are doing our best given these very complicated issues. And at the end of the day, how do we make sure that our workers are properly supported and compensated while at the same time our consumers receive and continue to receive the highest quality of care? Um, Asian Americans, we are the fastest growing group in New York City. Uh, one out of every three Asian American senior lives below the poverty line, and about two out of three are limited English proficient. What this means in our quickly aging population and quickly growing population is that there is a need for home health aides because we are the ones that are able to provide culturally competent and linguistically appropriate services. 
Um, while there are about 187,000 home care workers throughout New York City, and about twice that amount throughout uh, New York State, um, we already know that there's a shortage of home health aides to meet not just the current needs, but the projected needs of this growing population moving forward over the next 10 years. So we know that in this sector where the home health aides are predominantly immigrant women or women of color, that there's a need to stabilize a sector by providing better wages and better benefits. But once again, as a licensed home care agency, we're only able to do that if the Medicaid rates will allow us to compensate everyone fairly for all the hours that are worked and that we are able to um, have stable operations. And that's where it leads to the recommendations that I have today. Uh, Medicaid, as I mentioned, is the biggest uh, payer of home care and long-term care in New York State. And unfortunately, the low rates have been exacerbated uh, or exacerbated the unfair conditions for our workers as well as uh, the limits that we face in serving our consumers. Um, so one of the most stark examples of this uh, is what's known as the 13-hour rule. And our colleague Tara Klein over United Neighborhood Houses has already mentioned that. Um, and I just want to say that we support uh, the recommendations that UNH have put on the table around uh, how to support 24-hour um, care for not just the consumers, but also for the workers. Uh, there was a recent court decision uh, a couple weeks ago uh, which determined that the 13-hour rule as set by the New York State Department of Labor should be upheld. But in that opinion, it also stated that there are more expectations on licensed home care agencies to make sure that those 11 hours that these 24-hour workers are not paid, that we have to comply with lots of regulations, monitoring, and check-ins. And that's where, once again, through the low rates, we have very small administrative staff in order to follow through. So um, as we move forward on these contracts uh, or, any, or recommendations, I think it's very important uh, to once again emphasize how we are caught in the middle of regulations, contracts, uh, lawsuits um, in order for us to do what we want to do to better serve older adults and individuals living with disabilities and supporting their family members as well as our workers. So in order to address the retroactive issues uh, and better stabilize the sector, um, we are asking to partner with the city council and with the city to have a coordinated advocacy effort and educational effort uh, to go to the state together, and specifically the State Department of Health, to make sure that they invest more in this sector. Um, it's once again all Medicaid funded, and if we look at what the Medicaid dollars are that the state controls, having an investment, uh, a greater investment, is possible uh, into the home care sector. Um, we recommend that there's an intervention into this sector uh, on behalf of not just the home, health, uh, home care agencies, but also the providers and the consumers. And in order to do that, we need to create a permanent solution to support our workers. Um, the first one is we need a legislative solution. Now that the courts have decided about the 13-hour rule, um, what that means is that uh, we would still like to see quality care and support for our workers. So we are recommending two 12-hour shifts, so moving towards split shifts, that instead of having just one person working 24-hour shifts, that we all know it's better services for the consumer as well as better care for the worker themselves if they could work two 12-hour shifts and making sure there's that quality care for someone who's high needs for home care. Secondly, in order to make these two 12-hour shifts work, we need full funding for the 24 hours. And uh, the New York State Department of Health had not been public for the longest time on what this amount would cost. They would actually not even share with us the total uh, number of cases of 24-hour cases throughout the entire state of New York. Uh, we finally found out during the budget negotiations over the last few weeks that the total investment from the state through their Medicaid in order to have 24-hour care paid, sorry, 24-hour pay, would be $1.2 billion. Um, $1.2 billion, when you have a Medicaid budget that's in 70-some billion dollars, we think that's possible. The Medicaid budget also increased by over $4 billion uh, this past year. So that would have been possible in the increase to get the $1.2 billion. And again, we, look, we want to work with the city council to make these legislative and uh, budgetary recommendations happen. Uh, but moving forward, we also need to have best practices in this sector. In order to do that, um, we would like to work with the city council and have a work group where we can look at not just 
uh, managed care and long-term care, but how we can work together as a not-for-profit non licensed home care agency, working with uh, individuals supporting the workers and advocates supporting the workers, as well as um, elected officials where we can come together and really create a permanent solution for this growing population that needs home care, but we need to invest in the workers as well as the agencies. Um, while we've been focused, I've been focusing a lot of time about how we can work together at the city level to advocate for changes at the state. I'd also like to point out that um, there are some recommendations how HRA can do its work better. So <clears throat> I know the council is very familiar with a lot of the contractual issues and procurement issues that exist for human services nonprofits. Um, home care agencies uh, are not excused from these issues too. So uh, for example, our contract with HRA starts on uh, the, the it lines up with the state fiscal year. So the contracts actually start on April 1st. We were providing services for 11 months before we, we even saw a contract for that year. And then we did not get the funding until the contract was registered. And when we're dealing with millions and millions of dollars and trying to pay not just our administrative staff, but the home care workers, many of which who are family members, we need to see the money moving faster and the procurement process working faster. Also, not just with HRA, but also with the MCOs and MLTCs, we're not allowed to get advances through that. And because a lot of this is billing, um, we don't bill in advance and we have many of our claims are 90 days old, 180 days old, 360 days old. And as a nonprofit, while we're going through closing our books and going through audits, we're still trying to draw down these monies that are over a year late. So having a way for us to stabilize the sector, once again, is not just supporting the workers, uh, but it's also supporting the not-for-profit licensed home care agencies that rely on HRA contracts and MCO contracts. Um, and there's other recommendations that in uh, my testimony today, uh, but I think the key is that we would like to work together with the city council and we're glad there's more attention coming to this um, area. And we wanna make sure as we move forward and not just supporting the not-for-profits, but also supporting the workers, that inevitably that's a better way to support homebound seniors and disabled populations and their families. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony and the recommendation. So we'll see how we can uh, work together. You know, we'll, we'll contact you and follow up and make sure that we do something to really improve um, the situation for the workers and the clients. But thank you for being here today. I have one quick question. Oh, the number, yeah. do we know what the number of people receiving 24-hour care is? is it, yeah, it, statewide it has been yeah, from my agent, we don't know the statewide number. I think we can back into it with the 1.2 billion and try and play some math around it. But for my agency, uh, out of our 3,000, it's 266 to receive 24-hour care. Okay. And what is what is the uh, what is the current salary for a home care worker? Is that pretty standard, or does it vary by agency? It could vary by agency based on how they handle supplemental wages for wage parity, but generally speaking, the wages um, are minimum wage, and then uh, we are expected to follow through on what's known as wage parity. So whether you are a union employee or you go through the consumer directed program, uh, you get equivalent to $4.09 of supplemental wages on top of it. Um, some of that $4.09 per hour can be accomplished, uh, at least on the, uh, through, uh, if you take health insurance or if you get educational benefits or retirement plans, that it does lower the supplemental wages hourly. But generally speaking, the way the sector looks at it is minimum wage plus $4.09 an hour. Does that include um, employer-based uh, uh, health care service? Uh, yeah, health care. Because I, I think one of the complaints that we received many years ago was that there really wasn't any uh, health care coverage as part of these uh, contracts, and so it, it retention became an issue. Right. It, it depends on uh, whether the employee is a union employee or a non-union employee. So for us, uh, for those who are personal care assistants, they're all part of SEIU 1199, so they have the option of taking the health insurance through the union. 
uh, for those who are the consumer directed, so the family members, mostly family members that provide for their uh, relatives. Um, it really depends on the agency. For us at CPC HAP, we do provide health insurance and they have the option of taking it or not taking it. But we have heard from our work, many workers that um, they would rather take Medicaid because they feel the coverage is better if they take Medicaid themselves and they're eligible. Um, one of the challenges is I think what a lot of we've heard throughout um, many sectors, not just home care, is as minimum wage goes up, they start hitting the benefits cliff um, towards Medicaid and are they still eligible for Medicaid? Perfect, thank you guys so much for coming to testify. Councilmember Holden. Yes, I wanna thank you for your testimony and certainly great recommendations, all of you. Uh, I just wanna do a shout out to Sunnyside Community Services. They do a great job in my district. I love them, they're, they're wonderful. They saved a lot of seniors um, and uh, I can't say enough about them. So thank, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Cortez, thank you for mentioning uh, the dementia issue, which my mom has, like I mentioned before. She, I constant, I, you know, when I bring her out to healthcare or, or, or outside, I have to always apologize for her behavior. And but people, the healthcare workers don't understand. Many of them don't that this is what comes with dementia. So thank you for doing that. Thank you for mentioning that. And um, home care workers are woefully underpaid, and we will support you. I, I know I will. Anything that we can do um, with the state, but. Um, just knowing all the workers, many of the workers in my district, they do they travel long distances. They they get uh, minimum wage most of them, and uh, it's we're at a situation where we if we doubled their pay, that wouldn't be enough. So um, I want to thank you all for your testimony. Thanks. Okay, thank you guys for your testimony. This meeting is adjourned.